Wow. Well, welcome back. Sometimes it's hard to come back from those breaks, isn't it? When you get to snacking and talking and hanging out, it's like, yeah, I think, I think we can just stretch out another 10 minutes. I hear you. Oh, that's fun. Wow. So I want to mention now before we get started with the study is next Wednesday, that's the fourth Wednesday of the month, we will not be having the Wednesday night service, okay, because, you know, Thanksgiving is the next day. And so please visit your family, enjoy your family. There'll be no Wednesday night service next week, all right? And so enjoy family, have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll see you back on Sunday next week. All right, and this Sunday also we're having our after service lunch, which is going to be great Thanksgiving meal, the full deal. And so, uh, you know, come uh, come hungry and bring a friend. Particularly if you got if you know someone who maybe doesn't have family or have any plans, or even if they do, it doesn't matter. But this is going to be like the full family meal type thing, so it'll be really good for people to come and enjoy this. And the food will be good. <laughs> it always is. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to jump into the, to the Bible. So we're in Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12 tonight. Okay. So 1 through 12. And then, like I said, I want to close out tonight with some prayer for all these families and individuals, you know, that are going into these holidays. Because this week is when things ramp up. You know, people are making plans to be with family are there. The realization of the fact that some people don't have family around them, that's, all, that, that's hitting right now. And so I want to pray for people that they have a, you know, have a good holiday. All right, so here we go. Luke 24, 1 through 12. Verse 1. Very early that Sunday morning, the women made their way to the tomb, carrying the spices they had prepared. All right, so remember we talked about this, uh, what it looked like whenever someone, I think I talked last, last week about what it looked like whenever they buried someone like that. You know, they took, but they took basically a, a layer of cloth put a whole pile of these spices and herbs and things and then laid the body on it and then started wrapping and in between every layer they put more of those those different spices and blends so the person as they decompose they wouldn't smell so bad. All right? It kind of it was a preservative really is what it was and it, it smelled better. But these ladies had mixed up these that some extra spices. They were planning to go back after Passover because they couldn't do, you know, you couldn't work on Passover and, and they couldn't even add the spices to Jesus' body during Passover. And so they waited until after Passover. They had their, their big uh, stash of spices, and they were going to show up at the tomb after that and go ahead and put more spices on Jesus' body. Okay? And so they show up Sunday morning, and it says literally, and I like it, that in John chapter 20, verse 1, it says very early, and that's what I'm talking about right here in Luke, but while it was still dark. And so I talked about this last time as well, is... We, our day is a little different than their day, you know, the Jewish people's day. Um, their day basically ends at sunset, mm -hmm. where ours ends at like 12 a.m., okay? So we go from like 12.01 a.m. all the way to 12 p.m. Theirs, it starts normally right at daybreak and then rolls right to sunset, all right? Mm -hmm. So basically sunset to sunset is what their day is. All right, so I misstated that many are not daybreak, sunset to sunset. So their Saturday, their, their, their uh, Sabbath day ended at sunset Saturday. And so Sunday began at sunset plus one minute or whatever. All right, and so that's what it is. It says very early Sunday morning, and like John says, while it was still dark. So it was sometime probably in the a.m. hours, the twilight hours, what it actually says in the Greek, the twilight hours, whenever it's still a little bit of a glow, but the sun's not up. So very early in the a.m. hours, these ladies came to the tomb, and they brought their spices. So let's look at what happens. And so I want to, I'm going to add some other scripture in to give us a better picture. So this is Matthew chapter 28, same uh, event, but this is going to be filling the gap here, so it gives us a, be, a more full picture. All right? And a great earthquake had occurred. All right? So sometime right before those ladies arrived, an earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone from the opening of the tomb and sat on it. Verse 3, the angel's appearance was like lightning. Can you imagine now in the, that, that a.m. early hour is just probably barely enough light to see. And here's this glowing, glistening angel sitting on the stone. 
I'm sure that got some attention. Think of those uh, guards that were standing there, which we'll see what happens. All right, and his clothes were as white as snow. Verse 4, the guards shook, <laughs> paralyzed with fear at the sight of him. And, so we got some things going on here we're going to talk about. And became <coughs> like dead men, pale and immobile. All right. And so this angel showed up. Angels are quite powerful. And I've said on our best day, the weakest angel could take us out with a bam and we'd be done. <laughs> on our best day. All right. The angels are really, I mean, they're they're super powerful beings. And so when this angel shows up, I want to talk about what happened here. And I know that the Amplified says that the sight of him they shook and became like dead men. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. The sight would cause them to shake some for fear. But the sight of him did not cause them to pass out. The power of the angel caused them to pass out. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. All right? Because, you know, people get afraid, and fear is a terrible thing, and it can get really intense. And, yes, people occasionally can pass out if they're too scared because their emotions are overwhelmed, and they just, but I don't think that's what happened here. And uh, because, uh, let me just keep going. I'm going to tie this in with some stuff. Um, so when this angel shows up, he, he rolls the stone away. He's sitting on that rock. He's glowing like light. And he's radiating with this extreme power because he's a powerful being. And the guards, number one, they're afraid of him, so they start shaking. But his power and his presence causes them to shake too. And then, look at it, They're afraid. And see right here, and right here, I put, I, I did a towel size that became like dead men. And uh, there's a thing that happens whenever whenever an angel shows up in full power or when Jesus shows up or when the Holy Spirit's moving or when God's doing something. You know you know how you feel Holy Spirit even here? I mean, you feel his presence and you just kind of like, oh, my goodness. And sometimes, I mean, I can't really talk in here. I mean, sometimes I'm sitting here and I don't even want to talk or move. I just don't even want to do anything. And there are times when, it's, when God's power can be so strong that you pass out. See, our bodies, we have, we're bioelectric beings, okay? Basically, we have electricity flowing through us. We have circuits in our body that power the organs, simply put. And the thing is, whenever God shows up, he is all-powerful. His angels are powerful. And what it does, it fries our electric system is what it does. Yeah, it shorts us out. And that's when people pass out is the presence of God is so powerful, our body says, I'm done. <laughs> and it happens. And people say, well, I don't know about that. It's biblical. And I could put many, many references in the scripture up there. But keep in mind, I mean, there's there's, there's probably, I don't know, probably six to ten examples in the scripture, I don't remember the exact number, of individuals collapsing whenever Jesus shows up or an angel shows up. They just, I'm done. <laughs> and that's what happens here. You see, this angel is so powerful that at first they're afraid at the sight, but they're shaking their body says, I'm done. <laughs> because of the angel's power. His power caused her basically shorted them out and they passed out. And that's what that's actually what it means to note. Pale and immobile. That sounds like passed out to me, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you've experienced that, but I have. I've passed out under the power of God multiple times. Not just one or two, multiple. Cheryl has two. We've seen it in group meetings, we've been part of meetings like that. We've seen it happen a lot. All right, over the years. It happens. Um, so that's what happened to these guys. They passed out. And so let's keep rolling. But let me let me say one other thing here. And for those of you who are kind of uh, familiar with the charismatic movement, there's a term that's used in that movement that I don't like and I feel like it's inaccurate. They say slain in the spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't like that term. I feel like it is not the best wording for what happens. That terminology is not that good because nobody died. <laughs> so nobody's slain in anything. Okay, what I, and, and here's, you can take it or leave it. This is my word. I call it carpet time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's called carpet time, you know. Yeah, there's having some carpet time. See, that's more accurate. It's more pleasant than slain. You're, <laughs> nobody died. All right, so, so I just, if you want to use that, you could, I'll share it. You just say, hey, they're having some carpet time. Isn't that nice and friendly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's funny. So, and, and when these men regain consciousness, all right, which we'll see in a minute, they regain consciousness, 
and they immediately run into the city straight to the chief priest and tell them what happened. All right, and you can imagine that. They show up freaked out, share with the chief priest, and then I think, I forgot whether it's John or Mark talks about, immediately the chief priest start fabricating a big lie to cover this thing up. Because you know the chief priests aren't going to come forward and say, you know, an angel came and, and, and set Jesus. <laughs> Apparently there's some sheetrock work that needed to be done in that room. Yeah, I didn't. Well, I must have missed those spots. I didn't see them earlier. But there might be some sheetrock work after service. <laughs> Amen. All right. So these men run to town to the chief priest. You can tell we've raised a bunch of kids. I just laugh at it. It's like, just another day. <laughs> All right. So now we're picking up in verse 2 of Luke. Okay, so these ladies, okay, they're on the, they, they making their way to the tomb in verse 1. Then you see the earthquake happen. The guards freak out and pass out. And then the guards run, run away to town uh, to tell. And then in verse 2 we're picking up, arriving at the tomb, talking about the ladies. They discovered that the huge stone-covered entrance had been rolled away. So they went in to look. <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> Couldn't help it, man. I'd be curious, too. Like, how? Well, you know, the door's open. Nobody's guarding it. <laughs> Let's go see what's going on in here. And it says, it says that, but the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was gone. And if you remember, this was a new tomb that no one had been laid in and nobody was in. And God orchestrated that so there was no way that they could fabricate a lie about so, about somebody else being resurrected. Or a, a prophet was buried there and they laid Jesus on the prophet's bones and all of a sudden that made it happen. You see, there was a fresh new tomb. Joseph of Arimathea, the rich man, had it dug out of the hill for himself and he's the one who gave it to Jesus. So this was a rich man's tomb that was brand new that nobody had ever been in. So when you go in and nobody's there, Jesus was the only one that was there. So you know he's one, he resurrected, he's gone, which is good. All right. In verse 4, it says, while they were perplexed and wondering about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood near them and said, they're still in the tomb, and this is the ladies that brought their spices. All right. So these two angels stood next to them. That's interesting, isn't it? So... One of these angels is apparently the one that moved the stone, freaked out the guards. <laughs> the guards all, you know, once they regain consciousness and get kind of their self together, they run as fast as they can to get out of there. And so now these two angels uh, are standing next to the ladies in the tomb. Isn't it neat that all this stuff really happened and it's awesome? <laughs> Just amazing. Just amazing. Okay. Terrified. So the angels seem to have that effect. <laughs> Terrified. Look at this. The women fell to the ground on their faces. The men in white said to them, why would you look for the living one in a tomb? And sometimes they say, why would you look for the living among the dead? He is not here for he is risen. Isn't that neat? So the angels scared the ladies. The ladies fell on their face. The angels say, hey, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, by the way, why are you looking for the one who's alive in this place? It's the place of the dead. And it's kind of neat because then, look at this, this is Matthew 28, 6, the second part, the angels say, come, see the place where he was lying. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? The angels didn't just say, hey, why are you looking for, you know, looking for him here? He's, he's, he's risen, but Come here. You want some evidence? Come here. This is where he was laying. See where he was laying at. See? He's not here. You know, the truth of God will stand up under scrutiny. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to just touch this a little bit. You know, if God put a dream in your heart, everything in your life can be going the other direction. And when you look at that dream, it will still have power. You see what I'm saying? Because you can, life can try to filter that thing out. Life can try to beat it out. Life can try to discourage you. Life, you know, life happens to everybody. Unfortunately, we're not exempt in Christ. I wish we were, but we're not. Life happens to everybody. But no matter what happens around you, no matter what comes against you, no matter 
if everything in the world does whatever, that dream, when you look at it, it will still be just as strong as when God gave it to you. If you really look at it, it will not lose power. It will stand up under scrutiny. And I think that's an example. We're going to say, hey, don't just take our word for it. Yeah, I know we're glistening and glowing and, yeah, we're awesome. <laughs> but don't just take our word for it. Come over here and see for yourself. Is that neat? God's truth and God's word will stand up under anything. It doesn't matter what it is. And God does not mind showing off a little bit. And it's not pride. He can do that. He has the right. Yes. <laughs> Amen. So they went and saw where Jesus was lying. I think that's great. And then look at this, because I'm piecing, I'm kind of weaving this together. So look, they're at the place where Jesus is lying, and then the angels say, Have you forgotten <laughs> what he said to you while he was still in Galilee? Isn't that neat? Just when you tie the gospels together, it's beautiful, just the way everything unfolds. <laughs> Have you forgotten? And see, that's, you know, God help all of us to not forget those sweet moments with Jesus and to, and to not forget those breakthroughs and those victories. You know, tell your family about them. All you guys, you got younger family members, kids, grandkids. Tell them about what God did in your life. You want to build a lineage? You know, there's more to a lineage than just a blood passing. A lineage is those God moments, those God stories. That makes a difference, man. That makes a difference. The Jew, I don't agree with a lot of what the Jews did, but you know their oral traditions and oral laws, they were meticulous to pass down through the generations. All right? They became basically a religious bondage, but help us to keep those things and keep passing those God moments and those God victories and those God things. You know? Our kids are supposed to enter into our labors, and they're supposed to actually step up on our faith. They don't have to find everything out on their own. Help them step up. Give them that footstool of your faith. The destiny of the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinful men, to be nailed to a cross on the third day to rise again. And the angel is restating, have you forgotten this? This was Jesus' destiny right here. Remember? Remember he said this. He told you this. And look what happens. So this angel basically restates the revelation that Jesus had given them. And they're living. They're like standing right there in that moment that, that was coming. All at once. They remember his words. Isn't that neat? How many of you in here does a reminder help? <laughs> yeah. That's what I have here. The angels reminded them, and then they and then they remembered. Oh, praise mm. God! Mm. And I want to see. Look at this. This is really cool. I could not leave this out. This this comes to mind every time I read this story. I love the compassion of Jesus. And then the angels tell in Mark sixteen seven, but go tell his disciples and Peter. He, Jesus, is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. You know, it really, it gets my heart when I read, just when I see how much Jesus cares. You know, Peter had just been, he had just been come through a sifting time. The devil had run him through the coals mm -hmm. a lot, as much as he could. But remember, Jesus said, I pray that your faith won't fail you. And then he says, when you return, in other words, yeah, Peter, the devil's going to slap you around and derail you for a little bit. But when you come back, strengthen the believers. Strengthen the church when you come back. And it knows it was a win. And that we all go through times, and sometimes it'll derail us. It'll knock us off. Sometimes we have to take a break, man. I mean, there's been times in me and Cheryl's life where we couldn't even hardly do anything because we'd just been through such a tough season. We just had to take months and just kind of just regroup. Life happens, and it can be hard. But the thing is, is Jesus said, when you come back, strengthen my church. Well, what's great about that is as soon as Jesus resurrected, the angels told the ladies, hey, go tell Peter. <laughs> it, Jesus rose. Everything's okay. And I need, everybody need to hear it, but Jesus really cared about the fact that Peter just went through a hard time, and he wanted to make sure that he spoke directly to Peter and encouraged him. Isn't that neat?
Mm-hmm. Talk about the word in season. Now imagine Peter. You know he may have been he may have been already coming out of that or out of that. But you know what? Can you imagine what that did for Peter when the ladies came? So we saw angels and Peter. They said to specifically tell you what happened. Can you imagine what I did for his soul? I bet he just was like. Oh, thank you, God. You love me. You love me enough to tell me personally. I'm glad these guys heard about it too, but thank you. <laughs> you love me. <laughs> and I promise you, probably most of those other apostles and disciples in that room were like, yeah, Lord, thanks for telling us, but Peter really did need it after what he's been through. Because, <laughs> see, they had the details we don't have of what that sifting looked like. Because, you know, Peter did not keep his mouth shut. We all know that, don't we? So can you imagine all the details of the sifting that was shared with those around him? <laughs> man, I was over here, and they were just, oh, and they're probably like, man, thank you for speaking to Peter, God. <laughs> but God knows what we need when we need it. He always has the word in season for us. And he'll make sure you get it when you need it. Thank you, God. All right, let's go a little more here. Okay. Verse 9, leaving the tomb, they went to break the news to the 11, the 11 apostles, remember Judas was dead at this point, to the 11 apostles and all the others of what they had seen and heard. So they go to the group that's gathered in a room, more or less kind of out of the way right now, you know, probably, well, more or less almost hiding at this point, trying to regroup because their Messiah has just been murdered. In verse 10 11, it says, Now they were, these were the ladies, okay? They were Mary Magdalene. That was the one, remember, that Jesus set her free from, I think it was seven demons. And, uh, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Seward. And Mary, the mother of James. Also, the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But look at this. These are the apostles of Jesus Christ, the original ones. He wrote a lot of our, our New Testament. But their report seemed to them like idle talk and nonsense, and they would not believe them. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't say that without thinking, darn, (laughs) these are the the guys Jesus used to write most of our New Testament. And these faith-filled women came in, shared the word with them, and like, ah, that's that's nonsense. No. No, I know the facts. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith, man. Gosh, they would not believe them. Yeah, I'll just make a statement. I'll keep moving. Don't ever let your mind keep you out of God's provision. Don't ever let natural things limit your faith. Don't ever think, well, God can't do this because it hasn't been done. God can't heal me because this is terminal. God can't meet that need because, you know, I just don't see how. As soon as you start saying, God can't, God can't, God doesn't, I haven't seen that. God, you know, basically what you do is you're talking yourself out of faith, and you got to have faith to get provision in certain places. God will sometimes bust through and give you what you need anyway because he's God. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it's a partnership. And if you're sitting there doubting and discouraging yourself into a pit, God's going to have a hard time cranking you back out of that pit. So please, never never let natural things define what God can and can't do in your life. And that's what they were doing. Oh, no, I saw him die. I was there. I saw the blood. I saw the spear. I saw him. No, he's dead. They had three years with Jesus telling them exactly what was going to happen, that he was going to rise again. But their natural mindset limited what God could do for them in that place. It's not good. All right. Verse 12. This is the last one. Look at this. But Peter. <laughs> See, Peter just got that encouraging word. He's like, I don't know about you guys. You can doubt and this whatever. I'm going to check it out. <laughs> He jumped up. I like his translation. He jumped up. He wasn't he wasn't taking a stroll. He jumped up and ran the entire distance to the tomb. And you know that's accurate. <laughs> to see for himself. Stooping down, he looked inside and discovered it was empty. There was only the linen sheet lying there, 
staggered by this. He walked away wondering what it meant. You see, Peter was not in a, I don't believe Peter was in a place of unbelief here. He was in a place of contemplation. See, there's a difference. Unbelief and contemplation are not the same thing. Totally different. When God comes through, a lot of times we are just dumbfounded. Shock. That's right. Yeah, there's a shock, you know, and you, it takes your time, and you're not disbelieving. You're just like, whoa, this is a lot, God. And that's why I see people are like, whoa, okay, you're not here. Okay, a lot's happened. I saw you die, but you're not here. But this is what you promised me. So he was, I think he was in this contemplating state. And, and really, you know, contemplation, I'm going to tell you something. Whenever God's doing something in your life and you're contemplating, there's faith in that. Mm. There's faith in that. That is not unbelief. Contemplation is a faith place for us. So think about that. It's whenever you totally discount and start going south with everything and no this can't happen and that can't happen. that is that's that's a, the faith obliterator but contemplation is a place where holy spirit will stir and work with you and faith will be in that spot for you okay i ponder a lot of things with god he's never one time got upset with me about it so yeah so any thoughts really quick before we wrap up i want to pray for just a couple minutes for the for the holidays please Isn't this neat? And just what happened here? The way it unfolded? Yeah, when those guys didn't believe it, you would be thinking at that time, Jesus, are you really sure these are the right 12 men you picked? <laughs> I think that often through the New Testament. <laughs> you can put yourself in Peter's spot. I think all of us would have probably reacted exactly the same. Oh, I do. What happened? Where did it go? Where, where did he go? Where did the stuff it work? What happened? Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't have acted any different. No, no. And I've you know. seen how many things that Jesus did over and over and over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you saw faith. Faith responded to the news. When Peter jumped up and ran, that was faith. He was going to his Savior. He's running to Jesus. <laughs> Let me make one last thought with this. I love the fact that the first people Jesus appeared to, I mean, that the, basically that, that the angels appeared to and entrusted with the vital information was women, ladies. To me, that was a blessing. Because, you know, you know, guys can get distracted from time to time. So can ladies. But I will tell you something. Whenever somebody has a lady's heart like Jesus had those ladies' heart, he knew that they would make sure that the news got where it needed to go. So, you know, I want to comment on that, you know. And so women, women were actually the first sent ones in the Bible. They were the first sent ones. They were sent to share the news with the men. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah, I see all the ladies smile. Oh, you like that. <laughs> that was good. And the men were the first doubters in the Bible when he rose. Well, yeah. Minus the ones that were shocked and passed out and ran away, freaked out. But well, all the time Jesus told them he's just exactly what had to happen. And he yeah. tells them, I'm telling you this before it happened, so when it does, you can believe. Yeah. And when it happened, they still didn't believe. My gosh, I know. You know, so, so we'll just say this. There's hope for all of us. <laughs> yes, that's good. Yeah, yeah. If they entrusted those, that crew to write the Bible, and they did a great job, and they did it just right with Holy Spirit's help, Holy Spirit can do anything with us too. Okay. Well, let's take just a couple minutes and pray, okay? Um, just wanted to, I don't know, I just while I was working on study today and even thinking about things, I was just stirred with, these holidays, and there's been so much has happened over the last few years, and, and holidays are always tough anyway for some people. Holidays are really wonderful, and they are, they can be a little tough. But please just, let's pray just for a few minutes for the individuals who maybe lost a loved one in the last couple of years, or, or they don't have a, you know, a family to spend it with, or maybe their family just, you know, kind of dysfunctional and not so much fun for them. So whoever wants to, let's just a few of us pray for, for, for people through this. Thank you, God.
Who are praying these people, wherever they are, Lord, that they would sense your presence and connect with you. Mm -hmm. God, that you would, um, where there's pain, that you would bring comfort and healing. Yes. Lord, and that there be advance to people. Mm -hmm. I pray for hearts to be touched and moved and a light on their life. Mm -hmm. and and just somehow knowing that there's something more. Yeah. And just feeling it mm -hmm. and seeing it through the light of your children and strengthen them with whatever they have to face. And let them know let them come to you. Let them want to come to you. Well, we just ask that your spirit's poured out on the down and out and broken hearted. Mm -hmm. and that covers a lot, but we're thankful for each other. But bottom line is if it's just us, we're thankful uh, that goes directional up to you. Yeah. That's what that's about is to give thanks to you, even if nobody else does. And sometimes it's a lonely place, but uh, you're always there. We are thankful, 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 thankful for all you've done and all yes, you're doing. Yes. Lord, I pray that you help us to be a light for the Lord, we just shine the light on you and give you praise and thanks, Lord. You've done so much and you are still doing so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lord, thank you that you put the fatherless in family. Lord, you cause, Lord, those who don't have a family to find family. Lord, thank you for that. And God, I pray that even those who maybe don't have family to spend these holidays with, God, I pray that you would connect them with your children, God, with, 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 with godly families who would, uh, Lord, show them love and care and hospitality. And God would connect with them in that spot, Lord, that, that that place in their heart would be filled, Lord, with you, with relationship, with love, God, and they wouldn't wouldn't have a tough year this year. Mm -hmm. and Father, so many have lost family members, God, in other places, God. I just, Lord, all over the world, there, there are just tough things going on, God. And Lord, even for whatever reason you brought the Ukraine to mind, all those people, those families that have been destroyed over there. Mm -hmm. God, they, this will be their first Christmas without some of their family members. God, please help. Please, Lord, help. Mm -hmm. God, please help. Lord, make this year special for everybody that you can. God, I know there's a lot of people in tough places. God, but reach in and grab them. Just reach in and grab them and love them. And feed them. And give them more. Give them a place, God, and a people to be with. Please, God. Oh, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time, God, and thank you for how generous you've been with all of us. We are all people most blessed, God. Thank you. And thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.